Hello, and welcome to the AAMFT Podcast. Your all-access pass to the latest news developments and thought leaders in the world of systemic therapy. We strive to relate, educate, and innovate one episode at a time. I'm your host, Dr. Eli Karam, and we're brought to you by the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy. Our podcast explores topics that relationship-based therapists care about. In addition to featuring unique conversations and interviews with established experts, our show provides information and education on direct practice and emerging trends in the MFT profession. For more information, please visit us at aamft.org. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Eli, back with you on the AAMFT podcast. Thank you so much for joining us again. And today, we're talking all about integrating spirituality into the practice of MFT. I know when I entered the field, I thought that was a taboo topic. Uh, I'm trying to be a, a lay professional. If somebody wants to talk about their spiritual religious beliefs, they should go to a pastoral counselor. They should go to their minister. Why would they come to me? And the longer I've been in the field... The more I realize and what I know about client common factors, if spirituality, which as we'll learn today, is more than what's housed between the four walls of a place of worship, if spirituality is a strength in the client, then you would be negligent not to tap into that. It's sometimes the difference that makes a difference. So we're going to talk about that today with someone who wrote a really thought-provoking training article last year in the Journal of Marital and Family Therapy, our flagship journal, is Jackie Williams-Reed. Jackie Williams-Reed is an associate professor at Loma Linda University, where she teaches in the Department of Counseling and Family Science. She's a licensed MFT, therapist, researcher, trainer, and speaker. Her expertise includes relationships and health, personal and professional identity development, and integrating spirituality into the practice of systemic therapy. Her research is published in top journals, and she presents frequently at AAMFT and also internationally. I don't know, the older I get, uh, about 20 years into my career now, my own spiritual life has evolved. So integrating that in to the practice of systemic therapy, couple and family therapy is very important to me and certainly a lot of our listeners. So that's what we're going to talk about this hour. And the first question we always ask is your own kind of origin story, your journey into um, your interest in integrating spirituality with MFT. Please uh, let the listeners know how you got here. Sure. Um, I've been listening to some of the past podcasts and I hear you do this bit up front, like what, yeah, how'd you become an MFT? And I think it's so, so neat to hear those origin stories, right? I came into MFT. Really, I've been kind of a medical family therapist at heart since the beginning. I became an MFT because my grandfather was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and I had been raised by my grandparents. And so I lived with my grandma and grandpa while he was dying of pancreatic cancer. And there was just so much suffering that my family was experiencing that I ultimately wanted to sort of redeem that situation out of my own personal faith ideas. I I wanted a redemption story. And so I started to volunteer with children with cancer at a camp um, in my hometown. This is when you were like a teenager? Oh, yeah. Sorry. This was when I was in college. Yeah, early college. And so I had been a business major. Um, My family has a family business and I was expected to take over at some point. And so I was a business major, I was a communications minor. And then my grandpa got cancer. And that sort of changed everything for me. I started to work at this camp for children with cancer. I um, emphasized my communication studies major more than my business major. I ended up moving to Seattle and working at Children's Hospital in the oncology unit, um, working with families there. And then I was on a small team of 20-somethings, and we founded a nonprofit um, in Seattle under a church. It was under a big Presbyterian church in Seattle called Side by Side. And so we developed a camp, an annual camp for families who have a child with cancer and also a year-round volunteer program that matched the community members with these families who had often moved um, very far away to come to Seattle to get cancer treatment. And so it was really in working with those families that I then started to realize that I needed more skills. I would be sitting in waiting rooms, you know, a 25-year-old sitting in waiting rooms with mothers um, waiting for their child to finish a treatment or finish a test or whatever. And I just felt like I was learning so 
much about their suffering that what what can I do to help? And so I ultimately went and um, decided to get an MFT from Seattle Pacific University. And they have medical family therapy there. And they also are a religious institution. So they really emphasize spirituality there too. So I got a lot of training in both integrating the medical illness stuff and the spirituality stuff into MFT. And then I, after graduating from there, decided to get a PhD and a PhD in medical family therapy seemed to fit. So I got the, I went to ECU, East Carolina University, um, received my PhD there. And then I did a postdoc in pediatric palliative care and then got the job here at Loma Linda University. And Loma Linda University is a religious institution. I I tend to be comfortable um, working in religious institutions. Loma Linda is a Seventh-day Adventist institution and I don't identify as Seventh-day Adventist, but um, I identify as Christian. And so I have been there first, this is my eighth year and I was assigned the spirituality practicum my first year. And so I had an underlying sense of spirituality in my own MFT work. And I think working with illness brings up suffering. And anytime you're working with suffering, you're really working with spirituality, in my view. Being assigned the class really made me um, step it up a notch to think about spirituality integrating into therapy, since that's the outcome of the course. And so for the past seven years, I've been very involved in spirituality integration. Oh, it's an awesome story of how you got here. And you kind of just followed your passion, and it led you both to uh, what certainly you're known for in AMFT is what we're talking about today, but also your involvement with the medical family therapy and the family therapist and healthcare interest network. So let's just stay on that because some people will listen to you like, well, you know, I got into this uh, profession and my MFT was training was very different. It wasn't at a, a religious institution. So let's start just defining what you think the difference is between religion and spirituality. Yeah. So there's some, I feel like there's a caveat with all of this stuff, right? A lot of this and I think a lot of the way you approach these things needs to have an open mind and letting people define things the, the way they want to define things. That's sort of how I work in this area is giving other people a lot of choices in how they define words. And so even defining spirituality in, in religion are, you know, we all define it very differently. But in general, what I say, and I present to students, and they can kind of take it or leave it. But in general, I would say spirituality is the umbrella that um, I would say we're all spiritual beings. And we all have a spirituality. And that sort of can mean our life force, it can mean our ability and desire to want meaning out of life, um, our perspective, our philosophy about how we want to live, all of those things to me count as spirituality. And then religion is one aspect of spirituality. It's a way to sort of enact spirituality is by religious traditions, religious beliefs, religious values, religious activities, things like that. So I sort of use that as a way to think about the two and their relationship to one another. And I think sometimes people lump them together and you can be a very spiritual person, but not have a religious affiliation or belong to an organized religion. Exactly. And you can be very religious about your spirituality. Like if you've met certain people who maybe are into meditation or yoga practice, they can be very religious, you know, in sort of an adjective way about those things. And they make it very um, specific about what they want and they hold very clearly to those ideals and values. So I think uh, they they kind of form together. They can be very separate and they can also be very actively working together, those two terms and ideas. MFT is a health and strengths-based profession to start with. So you'll see a lot of terminology like spiritual wellness nowadays. What does that mean to you? I I saw that question and I was like, oh, I don't know if I have an answer. I, I think in general... I think it means what it means to you. You know what I mean? Like, I think for me, spiritual wellness means, and that can even change day to day. I I think I try to think of spiritual wellness as feeling comfortable with your beliefs and your perspective and how you're making sense out of your life. And you, you have a sense of how things are going and where you want things to go and how you're responding when things don't go as planned, that you sort of have this core way of viewing things that holds pretty steady for most of life's ups and downs. But I also think there are days when spiritual Spiritual wellness kind of isn't the goal. And really, you're just trying to get through a day. I sort of don't want to hold too tight to obtaining spiritual wellness, because I I think I'm a person who thinks um, things go up and down. Like for my own faith, I think some Sometimes I use the phrase, on the days I believe, um, this is what I think, but I have days where I'm not sure I believe um, all of the the aspects of my faith that I want to. They may be my ideals, but I'm not always living them out or um, not able to fully believe with my heart because of the suffering I'm experiencing or, or things like that. So I think spiritual wellness is very different for everyone and includes a lot of, I think, uncertainty, at least how I how I view it and have experienced it. 
you know, one of the ways the, the field is changing uh, 20 years ago when I came into the field, you know, so biopsychosocial model. And now uh, certainly the field uh, colleagues from East Carolina certainly uh, think this way, uh, a biopsychosocial spiritual type of lens. Uh, so I, I think it is becoming more and more built into the way we think systemically about people, family, and relationships. How has that evolved since you've been in the field? And then we'll talk about how you introduce this in, in training settings, or if you're a therapist that wasn't trained this way, how you start to integrate it into the way you work. But talk about the biopsychosocial spiritual assessment. Yeah, I think um, I do ask students in my one of my medical family therapy courses, I ask them to do a biopsychosocial spiritual assessment. And I think when you ask those more spiritual questions, it really does bring a different kind of tenor to the conversation. And so I have, I mean, since I've been an MFT, I think because I was at Seattle Pacific University, I learned biopsychosocial spiritual. So so I learned it all together. I, I didn't learn it separate. But I think for a lot of people, I have heard that when they add the spiritual, their eyes kind of like brighten and they kind of perk up of like, oh, what's that? And I hadn't thought of that. And in some ways you can say all those domains, biopsychosocial, spiritual, they all, well, they do all affect each other. And in some ways you can look at that spiritual aspect as really undergirds all of those. It's sort of like that meaning making, that perspective that you have, kind of your philosophy and values in life really undergird a lot of your actions, values, behaviors in your entire life. So I think it is such an important aspect to consider. And I do, I hear people sometimes say that spirituality should be kind of considered in terms of like psychology uh, or social in the psycho or social because of like social being church and church community or community of spiritual members and psycho is sort of being, you know, it's your, the way you make sense of things. But I really find if you separate it and think about it separately, then I think you're more prone to ask about it and think about it rather than just assume it's a part of the other two and would be brought up by a client. I think you have to kind of actually ask about it separately to get the conversation going rather than assume it will be brought up if it is indeed a part of the client's life in their psychosocial domains. How do I bring this up with a client? We'll talk on two levels, both with the client and then training uh, as far as a therapist and training our student. But let's talk in a clinical setting. How do I tap into this domain if I wasn't trained how to do this in graduate school? Yeah, I think I I can speak to how I'm doing this in class. I think there's I think there's a lot of parallels between your teaching students. You know, students sometimes are um, sort of in in some ways like my clients, right? Like I'm introducing these things to students; they're introducing it to their clients, and it's so a lot of the isomorphic process. Yeah, a lot of the same ideas fit in both ways. So I would say how I advise students to do it and um, is to to just do it, to um, start with, there are some different, there are some small assessments. There's the FICA. Um, there are these different like spiritual assessments that are really quick and easy. They have like four questions and they just ask about different aspects of a person's faith history. And they're very often very open-ended, but they can be like, do you have a faith or religion that you ascribe to? And the person responses, responds, do you want to integrate that into your treatment? Is there a part of that? What strengths do you derive from your spirituality or religion? So there are a lot of like basic assessments that are like this that ask very generally have a have a client just respond to very open-ended questions and then from there you can see what they say and see if it does resonate with maybe their presenting problem or the outcome that they want out of therapy and see if you can tie it together that way or if it resonates with something that you think would be a good intervention so there are ways to, to so to bring it up what i usually encounter in classes is usually some students are very excited to do this some students have already been integrating spirituality but when someone's really nervous about it or sometimes they just don't want to do it and they very students will tell me um, this feels like I'm forcing my client to talk about spirituality. And I say, well, we never want to force a client to talk about anything. So we want to give them the, but we do want to give them the opportunity to talk about it. So when students push back on me saying like, well, I don't want to talk about this with my client, I kind of say, you know, we're in this position where we're in a class where you need to. And so let's talk about why you don't want to, to do it. And sometimes they just don't want to oppress somebody. Sometimes they don't because they've been oppressed themselves. Sometimes they're really angry at religion. So they really don't want to bring it up. They have lots of reasons why 
why they're having a hard time bringing it up. But I usually just invite them to say, would you like to talk about your spirituality in a therapeutic context? Because what we know from the research actually is that clients want to talk about it. Therapists are the ones who are worried about talking about it. And I think there are real good reasons for us to be nervous about talking about it um, in therapy, but also if we are trained how to do it well, we don't have to be nervous. But I think clients want to talk about this aspect of their lives. They just don't know they can talk about it in therapy. Yeah. And you can't ask a client to do anything you haven't first done yourself. So I think a lot of times, whether they're chronologically young or even older, but if you have not evaluated your own spirituality, it's kind of hard to imagine if you're the if you're the therapist. It's kind of hard to imagine how that would work with your client. So yeah. those uh, those students that push back uh, or that say it's not important to them or they haven't really looked at them, how do you help them kind of go inward? Yeah. So in my uh, manuscript, I do outline the stuff I do in the class. And the manuscript is called Integrating Spirituality into MFT Training. And the first day of class, you know, we're kind of doing roll call, talking about the syllabus. And I spend about an hour at the end of that first class asking them very open-ended questions about like, what, what is, what, is the definition of spirituality? What is the definition of religion? Um, Is there a God? What is the purpose of life? Like I ask these very big questions and just let them all respond. And it's, it's nerve wracking. They don't really enjoy it per se, because they're usually saying, you know, they know each other well as students. Um, By the time they see me, they're often in their second year in the final quarter of their second year doctoral students. So they've known each other a long time, but they haven't honestly talked about these things with each other. They haven't talked about their spiritual lives. We tend to talk about our spiritual lives with our spiritual communities, and not necessarily just as part of our regular friendships with people who have different spiritual communities. And so a lot of times I'm asking them to sort of break a lot of rules. I'm asking them to break the rule of talking about their spirituality to people outside of that community. I'm asking them to talk about a very personal thing in a professional classroom setting. But I have to access this part, or in my mind, I need to access this part of them so that we can work on that self of therapist stuff so that we can get them into a client encounter and know that they can sort of handle talking about these very delicate things and being able to really be differentiated is a big part of my class. Being differentiated and being in conversation with people who are different from you and still being able to maintain a connection with them. So in that very first class, they're just answering big questions like, do you pray? And if you pray, how? Just to warm them up to talking about these things in front of each other. And I do a lot of normalizing in that first class and really trying to show them that they're in a safe space and really try to encourage them to, that whatever they're experiencing, whatever their definitions to those things are, it's okay. I'm not here to judge them if they don't have the same beliefs as me, if they're confused about what they believe. I'm really there to normalize it, give it space in the in the classroom. So I really start day one trying to get them to speak what they think and to let them know that it's okay what they think. Well, sometimes I think when, when I'm doing this, you, you kind of evolve uh, as, as a therapist. So as I was saying earlier, the, the older I get, the spiritual dimensions become more important to me in my own life. Outside of the therapy room, it makes sense why they would integrate in. So whenever I study these common factors like hope and and these these client motivation factors, so even if I see a constrained system, an individual or a couple or family, but that, that, that they've had something uh, that they can lean on that gives them strength, uh, and many times it is their spirituality or their religion, and therefore it becomes fair game uh, to me. And I, I think sometimes in training, you know, as long as you ask something uh, with the intention of trying to help the system, uh, you can pretty much ask anything. So it makes a, if you're trying to tap into hope and be a hope merchant, as Dick Schwartz would say, to me, spiritual religious beliefs, I mean, it's almost uh, criminal not to have an opening session or assessment without kind of tapping into that if it works for the client. But sometimes therapists don't think they can ask that. So the idea that it is fair game, I think is, is very important. Now, how would you help somebody? Obviously, when you're working with more than one people, person in the room, a couple or a family, you can't assume they have the same spiritual belief system. How do you work, let's say, couples or families where different members have different, either different levels of faith or maybe believe completely different things? How do you help navigate that terrain? Right. I think it can be so, so tough. And again, the same that's happening in the classroom is happening in the in the therapist office, right? So um, you really have to take into account, I think, like I said, I think people are nervous about talking about spirituality in therapeutic sessions. And I'm okay with that nervousness, because I think sometimes fear, 
fear sometimes is telling us to stop and fear is sometimes telling us to be careful. And so I think often the fear, the anxiety about bringing up spiritual religious things is is warranted because we need to be careful. And so, you know, even in class, I have every class is different because the students in that class are different. And so, so usually I know students a bit by the time they take that class, but I don't know them well. And so I have to balance a whole spectrum of people in that classroom. You know, I have to balance people who are very maybe devout Seventh-day Adventists, so they're in at an institution that um, supports what they believe in. And then I also have to balance that there may be an atheist in that classroom and that they're very uh, leery of our institution because of the religious tenets or whatever. And so I'm kind of constantly thinking about who's in the room, who can be what can we say? How How is one belief potentially constraining the entire class? And so it's the same in a family. We, we I have seen some um, students work working with families, and sometimes it's just too contentious, and it's really difficult to bring up the spiritual component. And it starts to become like, well, do I really need to bring up the spiritual component if so many members in this family have such strong disagreements about spirituality, what it should be, that maybe bringing up spirituality is not actually helping. It's actually causing another conflict. And so can I address the conflict through spirituality, because often I think the spiritual domain often reflects, can reflect the problem. If there's a problem in the family, sometimes it's also in the spiritual domain. So if a, a family has a lot of conflict, they may have a lot of conflict spiritually too. Like they, some of them believe a certain thing and other members don't, and they're really angry at each other for not believing the same things or not going to church the same amount or not engaging in the activities in the same way. So sometimes it's just the global problem is showing up in their spiritual life. And so sometimes working at it from the spiritual perspective can be a door, an entryway into working on the problem. Sometimes it's not the right entryway. It just is too fraught with emotion. And so working at the family's problem through a different way and not using spirituality is a better way to go. Sometimes spirituality is the resiliency piece and it is the part of the pro is a part of their lives that hasn't been totally touched by the problem and actually is a source of hope and strength. And so it actually can be used to balance out some of these difficult conversations when you're really kind of whacking away at the family's problem. So it really depends. It's so contextual. It's so unique to every family and to every class I have that I think that's really important to consider. You, I find you can't really have one way of working with this issue because it shows up in so many different ways for different people. Uh, so here, here's one uh, related to that. If you yourself are struggling in your own faith, you as the therapist uh, with your own faith or uh, spiritual beliefs, can you help a client who wants to deepen theirs? It's kind of like, you know, Murray Bowen would always say, you couldn't help a client get past to a certain level of differentiation higher than the one you were at. So I wonder if that applies to kind of deepening your spiritual connection too, which as you said, we know it's a huge protective factor leads to resilience and, and strength even in systems that look multi-problem and multi-constrained. So can you help a, a client build their spiritual resources, even if yours are low? Yeah, I think um, actually sometimes I think the better way to be is to be struggling with your own spirituality. Because sometimes when you're sure about your spirituality and it's like strong and just doing everything like it's just really working, I think sometimes then you run into more problems because you want people to have what you have and you'll almost push to get people to do things better, or at least that's been some of my experience watching some students. In some ways, I really, when you're struggling with your spirituality, I kind of personally, I think that's one of the best ways to be as long as you're okay with your struggle. I think that's the thing. You can be struggling, you can be sure, it doesn't matter. What matters is, are you okay with where you are? And can you be okay with other people being in the same or different place than you? So if you're struggling and someone else is struggling, can you be differentiated enough to not jump into their struggle or not have their struggles and their questions that are your same questions throw you off because suddenly they're trying to figure out if a God exists and you're in the same place and then you're like, oh my gosh, I can't help because I don't know if a God exists. So you sort of put on the brakes or you're so, you think you're so similar to them that you, that you miss things. You don't catch that they're, 
maybe having a problem with something or you're so similar that you're just not catching the differences. So I think really it's, it doesn't matter kind of where you are spiritually. It really matters how you feel about where you are spiritually. And if you can be okay with where you are, um, you often then are okay with where other people are. So if you're very devout and someone else is very uncertain, if you're okay with being devout and other people being uncertain, you can do great therapy and, and vice versa. But there really is, that's what I notice a lot in class. It takes us a few classes after that first day where we do the general openers about spirituality. The next class, they do like a self-assessment of their spirituality. And it's a, um, a qualitative assessment often. So it's like doing drawings or making like a life map or an eco map and kind of talking about their spiritual life in general. And again, that's another class period where I do a lot of affirmation. And then with them eat them sharing with each other their spiritualities and how they look. It helps normalize that not everybody has it figured out. Not everybody's doing it perfectly. And so I think that is just such a a huge part of doing this work is really coming becoming at peace with where you are, even if you're not at peace. It's sort of that weird thing, though. It's like being at peace with not being at peace with your spirituality, because then that allows you to engage in other people's ways of doing spirituality without judging them, without judging you, sort of being able to be open to different experiences. You know, sometimes therapists are trained, oh, not to self-disclose, but uh, and certainly self-disclosure for self-disclosure's sake doesn't help. But when it's something like that that humanizes you, your own struggle, as most people do, as they ebb and flow with their beliefs, as you were saying earlier, and their spirituality and their faith. I think that normalizes a lot for a client and opens up a place for a dialogue versus, as you said, coming from this position of uh, you do it this perfect way. And if you don't have the same beliefs I do, or you don't integrate it the same way I do, then you're less than. So I, I do think that kind of one down approach, it fits well with therapists early in their career. And it it probably helps build an alliance and opens up room for a dialogue between therapist and client about spirituality. What other uh, tips, uh, and you know, this this article that you mentioned, uh, integrating spirituality into MFT training, a reflexive curriculum and qualitative evaluation. It's uh, in our flagship journal, the Journal of marital and family therapy, what other tips uh, or things have you learned by teaching this class that can help someone out there kind of starting this journey of integrating this into their clinical work? Yeah, I think one question that students always ask, and I think a lot of people ask is like, if a client, you know, sometimes they just, it's the first session or a first phone call and they say, you know, are you a X, you know, religious person? Um, And sometimes it it seems like that question is usually coming from religious clients who want to know if their therapist shares um, a similar religion. But I think it can also come from people who've been burned by religion and they want to know if their therapist is religious. And so um, that's a common question of like, what do I say when people ask that? Again, that really depends on some contextual factors. I think I tend to advise students that they have an op- they have options and they don't have to say the same thing to every person who asks. They can kind of assess the situation and see what they think. But sometimes I think you can say, um, you know, maybe you don't want to do self-disclosure. That's a common thing we're taught is don't do too much self-disclosure. And so we do a therapeutic thing where we put it back on that client and say, well, that's an interesting question. Can you tell me why you're asking? You know, what are your concerns? What are your thoughts? And sometimes just getting the client to voice why they're asking, what they're concerned about, you can address it in ways that don't require you to identify who you are. Because the pro with identifying with who you are in terms of spirituality and religion, if the client's okay with that, then great. Um, but if, of course, if the client isn't okay with that, then, then what, what does that mean? And, and you, and I always think you might be the, a therapist in a a certain region of the, you know, of your community that has a very um, specific religious or spiritual mindset. And if you're different, what if you can't get clients, if you start saying that you don't ascribe to those values? Um, So then is it in your best interest to tell people to divulge all of these details? But some people believe you want to be honest. And if a client asks, you should tell. So people have all sorts of different values around this. And so I I have to work it out individually with different students about how they want to say some feel like they don't want to share any personal information. And I say, that's okay. So let's talk about a way you can say that in a way that's relational and connecting. And then others are like, I'd feel really weird not telling them if they wanted to know. And I'm like, okay, well, let's think about a way that you can tell people what you believe, but maybe you don't have to say everything. You don't make it about you, but how can you present yourself in a way that is still therapeutic and, and you have professional boundary in it? So that's a common question that I, I think has so many different 
um, answers to it. But I think it shows the anxiety people have about like, should I share who I am um, with this client? Should we share these parts of ourselves? Because you even think like at holidays, people say, you know, you don't talk about politics or religion, right? And so um, the therapy room kind of upholds those rules too. Like we kind of think we're not supposed to talk about those things here. We're not supposed to talk about our differences. And so it is. Sort of, it can be kind of tricky to get into those conversations and identify ourselves and begin a conversation about spirituality. You know, I, I do think that is a very common question. And um, sometimes you get, if you're working with couples, well, are you married or are you in a relationship or do you have this? But it is a very personal question. And to me, it creates a space, open a dialogue. You know, this is what I believe. But even more than that, how is that important to you in your selection of a therapist? How do you think uh, that relates to the fit in what you're trying to get out of? And to me, if, if they bring that up, that opens up a direct dialogue to talk about how spirituality or religion functions in their life. Uh, that actually is a great opportunity if you ask me if they if they do lead with that. When you think of the stories uh, and either training or supervising your direct experience with clients, tell us uh, a good story that really help solidify in your mind how you think about integrating spirituality into the practice of MFT? Um, I guess the story that one story that comes to mind is um, I had a student who definitely pushed back at the beginning, like did not want to ask about spirituality, really felt like it was offensive to even ask. And the student was a great clinician, great in all these other ways. And I, I actually was surprised that I got so much pushback in this class because that just wasn't kind of the personality of the student. So I was like, oh, that's an interesting reaction. And so they showed me their first clip and they really just perfunctory asked spiritual questions, like looked at their document, asked the question like verbatim, looked back down to the document, asked the next question, and then ended the assessment and said, you know, thanks for talking about that. And kind of like, now let's get back to, you know, the real stuff. It was a perfunctory step. Yeah. And I, and actually, I'm okay with that now. I definitely tell students, just try it. Because I think that's sometimes that's your first step of like, ask the question, ask it like a robot, <laughs> and then get through that. Because of course, we don't want to ask it like a robot. But I also am like, if that's where you're at, that's where you're at. We just need to get you th to at least speak it in the room and see what happens. And when she showed us that clip of that assessment, she was so sure that what she saw was a client who didn't want to talk about spirituality. She was convinced. And she actually opened up the clip like that saying, well, I think you'll see that, you know, I told you that my clients don't want to talk about this. And so this is like, you know, a perfect example of a client who's really closed to this. And so why I don't think I should ask. And it was what is amazing is I, I rely on students in the classroom too, to make sure I'm not the only one seeing something. And so in this case, it was great because most of the students were on board with me. What we actually saw was how uncomfortable she was and how much that client actually was interested in the questions she was asking. It was one, it's just, and I, and I, that actually happens pretty often. A student will be pretty sure that they see their client closed, not interested. And when we watch the tape, we're like, actually, you're closed and not interested. And the client actually looks like they want to talk a little bit, but you're kind of cutting them off. Um, you're moving on pretty quickly. And you could just ask a follow up question of like, you know, do you have more to say about that? Any thoughts? And so what's really fascinating to me is just that whole thing that we think they don't want to talk about it. And so then we'll project that they don't want to talk about it. And really, the therapist is more uncomfortable than the client. The client is actually wanting to talk about it. Yeah. And that's actually in several places in the literature saying like clients want to, um, therapists, because they're not trained, don't want to. And so that makes sense. But, you know, the opposite is also true. I don't want to, I want to make sure we, you know, speak to the spectrum that some, some students that I've supervised see the client as being really interested. And then we'll watch the tape and be like, whoa, this client is very uncomfortable. And you're, you're pushing them and they don't want to keep talking. And so it just shows in general, you know, in therapy, we can see what we want to see. And that's why videotaping yourself and showing it to your supervisor works so well. And always just being able to check in with a client, like, is this okay? Are we talking about this in a way that is, is going okay for you? Um, and really trying to say that multiple times, because often the first time we ask that they won't be honest, but to really show that we really want to know and make sure we're proceeding um, in a way that works for them. So I just see that we're so blind sometimes to ourselves, to what we're doing in the room, and we're so blind to what a client wants in the room that I think spirituality has shown me how important it is and how it can be used in a negative way in the therapy room. So I really just advocate training. Um, 
to really not just start doing it to make, make sure you have a, a consultancy group or someone you can talk to about it who's doing it as well to keep track of all these dynamics that can be happening because I do think it's a fragile area and you do need to do a lot of self-therapist work and just checking of yourself to make sure you're kind of staying in, in tune with, with the clients. Yeah, you're leading into my next question. So clearly integrating spirituality into MFT is in the scope of our practice, but unless you've done the work, it may not be in the scope of your competence, so to speak. So if I haven't taken your class at Loma Linda, been trained a co empty program that based in a religious institution that uh, naturally integrate spirituality into the training. Say, I haven't done that, but I want to learn more. Tell us some of your favorite resources or places to increase your comfort in doing this type of work and integrating it into your way of practicing marriage and family therapy. Yeah, well, I would definitely recommend um, in my article, I do a, a, an overall lit review of MFTs and spirituality. And so definitely there are a lot of articles in there. Just the lit review is interesting, I think, to look through and see some of the trends in the field. And then the whole resource list from that article has a lot of really good MFT articles about spirituality. Uh, from a Walsh has written a book. It's called Spiritual Resources in Family Therapy, and that's sort of a, a Bible um, of some sort of us working with spirituality. I really like Griffith, Griffith and Griffith, and they. Um, it's called Encountering the Sacred in Psychotherapy: How to Talk with People About Their Spiritual Lives. It has a narrative therapy aspect, and I, I was trained in narrative therapy, so I like that. Um, and then also my article, there is there are online aspects of that article. So I do have an example of selected readings that I have used in the past and then different articles that I use that touch on all these different aspects of spirituality. So I think it can be great just to do the reading yourself. And it, ideally, you could find someone in your community or somehow a group that would work on spirituality. I actually thought that a tin could be created uh, with WMFT about spirituality. I think it would be a great tin. Um, maybe I'll be involved in that one after my, my time with the medical yeah. family therapy one. Yeah. I think it would be great. Uh, Jackie, speaking of a topical interest network, which you hear us talk about from time to time on the, the podcast, certainly kind of driven by member engagement. And I know uh, we've had Froma on the show. That is a great resource. Like you said, like the, the, Bible. We were talking more about her overall career, but we, we certainly touched on this. But, you know, you also uh, being at the forefront of, of, as we've talked about this hour of training students, what do you think we need to do as a, a field and as the AAMFT to integrate this more into training? Because I'd uh, I'd like to think that you don't have to go to an MFT program with a religious affiliation in order to get this training. What do you think we need to do in that domain to move the field forward? You know, I, I actually was listening to the podcast with Fred Piercy and just, I just adore that guy. And um, he, he doesn't know me well, but I, he really shepherded this article through the process in the JMFT. It was one of his last articles he did as editor of JMFT. In, in our conversations back and forth about the article, he really emphasized the point that spirituality really should just be considered part of diversity and cultural competence. Like, why do we not include it there? You know, we, we think of the other aspects of diversity, but spiritual diversity is really important for us to be trained on. So I think it should really just be included in cultural classes and diversity classes and just make it, make it more known that it's a diversity component. Yeah. That was a, a great place uh, to put it. That's where we put it in my program. We also... Uh, as I was saying earlier, fitted in these uh, client kind of common factors around uh, motivation and around hope and and being able to tap into that is is very powerful. I also think it could fit into supervision. I mean, what you're doing in the classroom is very powerful, but what a supervisor has the ability to facilitate in supervision, either individual or group, is very important. And then from a research perspective, uh, like you said, and you're, you've done lit reviews, how are we doing as a field as far as integrating this into our research agenda? Not great. <laughs> we have a lot of conceptual ideas, which I think are wonderful, but it'd really be great to have more interventions that have been tested, case conceptualizations, uh, even more teaching. I think mine was the first that I could really tell that really showed what I was teaching, the concepts I was teaching, how I was teaching it. So it would be great to see more ways of teaching it, um, kind of best practice kind of stuff. So I think there's a lot of room for us to to work in this area. And I do think it is so important. One of the my favorite things about this class 
is, you know, my own spirituality was really not a mess, but in some ways, let's just say it was kind of a mess when I started this class. And I was a, I was not the same sort of religious denomination as the institution I was at. So I was like, should I really be teaching this class if I'm not the same denomination? Like it made me nervous. And honestly, what has kept me going in this class is how much of an impact it makes on students. It's, it's not for everyone. Some students, even when they're done with the class, I might even say something about like, maybe this isn't for you. You know, maybe bringing up spirituality in session isn't for you or isn't for you right now because they just struggle. They can't quite get differentiated enough to not judge clients. They just are having a hard time bringing it up. And so I sort of say, you know, maybe just at this moment, is is not the time. Um, but for the most part, students seem to have a life changing experience after this class. One, I think it personally changes them that they come to a sense of peace about their own religion, spiritual experience. And if you think about it, if I'm working with students in a doctoral program, they're often late 20s, early 30s. And so they're still individuating from their family. Um, and so when you leave your family's religion and try to make it your, your own, or you're not, not that you have to leave it, but you know, it it's different usually. You're usually doing it a little differently than your parents did it, or you're doing it completely differently than your parents did it. Choosing it versus inheriting it, yes. Right. So it's just different. And so they're really in a stage where they're really trying to come to terms with that. They're really, and even sometimes when they're sharing their answers in class, they're like, oh my gosh, my mom would kill me if she heard me say this. So they're really trying to come to peace with themselves and who they are and what they believe. And so I think that really changes them. But also when they start integrating it into therapy, I've had so many students say, I actually feel like I'm doing therapy now. Like there's something about asking about the spiritual component and bringing in this extra level of like meaning that can change them really drastically and they start doing therapy completely differently. And so that's just so inspiring. And I, I personally think therapy, just in general therapy, is we're, we're being spiritual healers. That's my own personal belief. You know, just the act of therapy, whether you're act, asking about spirituality or not, is a spiritual practice with people. Um, but when you, when you officially ask about spirituality and open up that conversation about how do you make meaning of life? What's your perspective on suffering and goodness? And um, what do you believe? What gets you through the day? Do you pray? You know, asking about those things really gives you a different insight into people. And um, I've just found students have been so positive about the class that that's why I was inspired to write the paper. I was like, I'm getting so much positive feedback. I feel like the world has to know about this. And so um, I wanted to contribute to the to the field that way. Yes, wonderfully said. I can't thank you enough for, for joining us. Now, JMFT article you've referenced many times uh, in our talk today. In addition to that, what do you want to do to do now that you've taught this class and you know you have varied interest, as you said, in medical family therapy and doing this? What do you want to do next uh, in your career as it pertains to integrating spirituality into MFT? You know, I'm trying to figure it out. Um, I wanted to say one little thing, the origin story of this article, and it'll apply to what I'm doing next, is probably in my third year of teaching this course, I got the idea that I should write something up. But it was only my third year. So I was like, who am I going to write something up, you know? But that idea would not go away. Like I would think about it walking my dog. I would think about it in the shower. I would think about it as soon as I woke up. It was like, it was haunting me. And finally I had kind of the, it's my co-authors on the paper. I kind of had the right students at the right time. And I said to these two students, would you want to do a paper on this? Cause, cause they were students that had had um, really rich experiences in the class. And I said, would, you know, would you like to do this paper with me? And they were like, yes, let's do it. So this paper was like born out of years of it, like wandering around in my brain. It like, it just like wouldn't let me go. And so I love the story of this paper because, and even every sentence, I went back and reread it last night before this podcast and every sentence, I can almost remember every sentence, writing it, crafting it. And I would craft that sentence on, like I said, like on a walk with the dog, I'd come back home and be like, okay, I have the next sentence. Like something felt so compelled about this article. And that doesn't happen with all of my research. This one was just very special in that way. It really, I really felt drawn to it or almost pushed towards it. I am really still waiting for for something, some kind of inspiration to hit. So, something is bubbling around in my head, but I don't quite have it fully figured out yet. But I do think I kind of want to create potentially a model about spirituality and maybe illness and therapy in general. I don't know. There, there's something starting to coalesce in my brain, but it's it's not quite there yet. 
Yes, yeah, it's, it's a living, breathing, evolving thing. But that is that is something clearly, as we can tell this hour, you are passionate about. And I can't thank you enough for joining us on the podcast, uh, Jackie. And um, we will talk down the line. And thank you so much for enlightening us and really creating a space for a lot of therapists that you know have thought about in- integrating this into their work uh, that now that they have kind of the the building blocks and the starting steps to do that thank you so much yeah well thank you so much for the invitation and i i welcome emails from anyone you know you yes, can find tell me us real quick how to get you yep yeah, if you Google me, you you can find contact information. But my name's Jackie Williams Reed, and so my email is kind of a long one, but it's J W I L L I A M S R E A D E at L L U dot E D U. So I welcome I welcome emails, I welcome conversations. If you see me at a conference, um, I welcome conversations about this. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, a great dialogue. Thank you so much, Jackie. Those of you that want to know more, article from JMFT came out in 2019. So uh, all members, uh, if you don't have a university affiliation or you're not a student anymore, all members of the AMFT, uh, along with their membership, comes complimentary online access to the Journal of Marital and Family Therapy. And you can find that article from 2019. Again, integrating spirituality into MFT training, a reflexive curriculum and qualitative evaluation. You can find out more about Jackie on JackieWilliamsReed.com. That's Reed, R-E-A-D-E. Go to her website. You can actually see a deeper dive about a one-hour lecture she gave at Loma Linda on this exact topic. Here at the podcast, we love to hear from you. That's how we get a lot of the guests, uh, ideas both for guests and for topics. And we kind of alternate between going into topic areas like we did today, spirituality and one of my favorite parts of the show, talking to the pioneers and model developers in the field. All of the back installments of the podcast, now into our second season, are available wherever you get your favorite podcast. Mine is Apple Podcasts, but you can also go to Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, and catch up on all the back installments if you haven't. We've talked to a lot of Movers and shakers in the systemic therapy field in the last year and a half, and we'll continue to do so. Keep the conversation going. Follow us on Twitter. I'm at Dr. Eli Live. You can get a hold of me at info at elikaram.com. That's E-L-I-K-A-R-A-M.com. The AMFT is at the AMFT on Twitter, and you can send them an email at communications at amft.org. Until next time, my friends, stay systemic.